guys ready for a narrative badness experience? I sure hell am. Hello folks, welcome to Dagon. From what I can gather, it should be a faithful adaptation of an HP Lovecraft novel from 1919 uh, of the same name. And from what I can sort of gather, we are taking the role of a guy who has escaped prison or something and while fleeing has crashed his little boat on a horrible little island where all sorts of eldritch horrors are going on. So, without further ado, let's get to it. Yeah, Dagon is a faithful uh, interactive adaptation of H.P. Lovecraft's work focused on story and atmosphere. You will not find difficult choices, action consequences or inventory management here. And movement and limiters to processing through locations along with the plot. So, like, really narrative based. I am writing this under an appreciable mental strain, since by tonight I shall be no more. Okay. During the game you'll encounter interactive elements. Some of them will allow you to continue your journey, others reveal interesting facts about the original short story, uh, its historical background and the author. Okay. Some of the trivia is hidden. In order to find these, you can focus your eyes and look for the elder signs. So right click. Okay. Lovecraft's letters. As, a le um, as the letters, my case is peculiar. I write such, such things exactly, easily, and as rapidly as I would utter the same topics in conversation. Indeed, an epist epistolary expression is with me largely replacing conversation as my condition of nervous frustration becomes more and more acute. I cannot bear to talk much now and I'm becoming as silent as a spectator himself. My loquacity extends itself on paper. HP Lovecraft to Reinhard Kleiner, December 23rd, 1917. Throughout his life, Lovecraft penned around 100,000 letters to his friends and fans, out of which about 10% survive to this day. But this tendency to endless correspondence was a relative late growth. In youth, I scar scarcely did any letter writing. Thanking anyone for present was so, was so much of an ordeal that I would rather, rather have written a 250 line pastoral or a 20 page deitize deitize on the rings of Saturn. Okay. Lovecraft would often skip meals to afford postage collections on his correspondence has been published in various books and selected letters can be found online. Some readers consider them his most important legacy. You can write the discovered trivia immediately or go back to them later in the main menu. Turn off displaying trivia if you find that the featuring distracted from the story. This can be changed anytime in the options. Show trivia upon finding them. Yeah, we're gonna do that. I'm guessing. Nope, can't turn any further than that. Okay. Penniless, and at the end of my supply of the drug which alone makes life endurable, I can bear the torture no longer, and shall cast myself from this garret window 
into the squalid street below. Do not think from my slavery to morphine that I am a weakling or a degenerate. When you have read these hastily scrawled pages, you may guess, though never fully realize why it is that I must have forgetfulness or death. Morphine. Morphine entered into use in the 19th century and was routinely administered to treat severe pain during the American Civil War and World War I. It was also sold without restriction with until 1914. Morphine became more popular after the invention of the hypodermic syringe around 1854. Frederick Sertiner first isolated the substance, originally named it Morphium, after Morpheus, the Greek god associated with dreams. Well, at the time when Dagon was published, morphine abuse, known as soldier's disease, already posed a big problem in the United States. It was in one of the most open and least frequented parts of the broad Pacific that the packet of which I was supercargo fell a victim to the German Sea Raider. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the ocean forces of the Hun had not completely sunk to their later degradation. So that our vessel was made a legitimate prize, whilst we of her crew were treated with all the fairness and consideration due us as naval prisoners. The Huns. The Huns were Central Asian nomads who established a dominion in Europe and invaded the Roman Empire in the 5th century. They were known for brutal, deadly warriors and masses of quick raids who also developed powerful comp uh, composite bows, lassos and early siege weapons. During World War I, the British used the word Hun as a cinnamon, cin synonym for Germans in order to emphasize their brutality. However, the term originated when the German Emperor Wilhelm II gave a speech to his troop on the 27th of July 1900 before they embarked to China. Should you encounter the enemy, he will be defeated and no quarter will be given. Prisoners will not be taken. Whoever falls into your hands is forfeited. Just as a thousand years ago, the Huns under their king Attila made a name for themselves. On that even um, on that even today makes them seem mighty in history and legend. May the name German be affirmed by you in such a way that China uh, such a way in China that no Ch Chinese will ever again dare to look across look cross-eyed at the German. The refusal to take prisoners was a clear breach of the law and customs of war were uh, and customs of war adopted during the first Hague Convention in 1899. So liberal indeed was the discipline of our captors that five days after we were taken I managed to escape alone, in a small boat, with water and provisions for a good length of time. Oh, there's some water and provisions. When I finally found myself adrift and free, I had but little idea of my surroundings. Never a competent navigator, I could only guess vaguely by the sun and stars that I was somewhat south of the equator. Of the longitude, I knew nothing, and no island or coastline was in sight.
The weather kept fair, and for uncounted days I drifted aimlessly beneath the scorching sun, waiting either for some passing ship or to be cast on the shores of some habitable land. Yeah, we are in the middle of nowhere. But neither ship nor land appeared, and I began to despair in my solitude upon the heaving vastness of unbroken blue. The change happened whilst I slept. Its details I shall never know. For my slumber, though troubled and dream infested, was continuous. Horsewits. <laughs> when at last I awoke, it was to discover myself half sucked into a slimy expanse of hellish black mire, which extended about me in monotonous undulations as far as I could see, and in which my boat lay grounded some distance away. Though one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery, I was in reality more horrified than astonished. For there was in the air, and in the rotting soil, a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. The region was putrid with the carcasses of decaying fish, and of other less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unending plain. Perhaps I should not hope to convey in mere words the unutterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. There was nothing within hearing and nothing in sight save a vast reach of black slime, yet the very completeness of the stillness and the homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with a nauseating fear. The sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black in its cloudless cruelty as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. As I crawled into the stranded boat, I realized that only one theory could explain my position. Through some unprecedented volcanic upheaval, a portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface exposing regions for which innumerable millions of years had lain hidden under unfathomable watery depths. So great was the extent of the new land which had risen beneath me that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean, straining my ears as I might. Nor were there any sea fowl to prey upon the dead things. All right, keep pushing the fish. For several hours, I sat thinking or brooding in the boat, which lay upon its side and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for traveling purposes in a short time. That night, I slept but little and the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water, preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. On the third morning, I found the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease. The odor of the fish was maddening, but I was too much concerned with graver things to mind so slight an evil, and set out boldly for an unknown goal. Okay, let's walk across the slime then. All day I forged steadily westward guided by a faraway hummock which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. Yeah, okay. Um, 
these things look like they got very bitey very fast. Whale? What looks like massive spider legs with squid parts. That night, I encamped, and on the following day still travelled toward the hummock, though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I had first espied it. Looking forward to seeing what a hummock app uh, is. Yes, I've never heard that word in my life. By the fourth evening, I attained the base of the mound, which turned out to be much higher than it had appeared from a distance. Oh, that's some... Um... Weird lighting going on there. It disappears when I look directly at it. An intervening valley setting it out in sharper relief from the general surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. I know not why my dreams were so wild that night, but ere the waning and fantastically gibbous moon had risen far above the eastern plain, I was awake in a cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again. And in the glow of the moon I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of the parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy. Indeed, I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Picking up my pack, I started for the crest of the eminence. I have said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plain was a source of vague horror to me. But I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked down the other side into an immeasurable pit or canyon, whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illumine. I felt myself on the edge of the world, peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. Through my terror ran curious reminiscences of Paradise Lost and of Satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness. As the moon climbed higher in the sky, I began to see that the slopes of the valley were not quite so perpendicular as I had imagined. Ledges and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent, whilst after a drop of only a few hundred feet, the declivity became very gradual. Urged on by an impulse which I cannot definitely analyze, I scrambled with difficulty down the rocks and stood on the gentler slope beneath, gazing into the Stygian deeps where no light had yet penetrated. All at once, my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose steeply about a hundred yards ahead of me. An object that gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. Okay, I guess we're going closer to that thing then. That it was merely a gigantic piece of stone, 
I soon assured myself. But I was conscious of a distinct impression that its contour and position were not altogether the work of nature. A closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express. For despite its enormous magnitude and its position in an abyss which had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young, I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith whose massive bulk had known the workmanship and perhaps the worship of living and thinking creatures. Dazed and frightened, yet not without a certain thrill of the scientist's or archaeologist's delight, I examined my surroundings more closely. The moon, now near the zenith, shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed in the chasm, and revealed the fact that a far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom winding out of sight in both directions and almost lapping my feet as I stood on the slope. Across the chasm, the wavelets washed the base of the Cyclopean monolith, on whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. The writing was in a system of hieroglyphics unknown to me and unlike anything I had ever seen in books. Consisting for the most part of conventionalized aquatic symbols such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. Several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown to the modern world. Well, some of them looks fairly normal. That's like starfish, crab, shark, another shark, jellyfish of some sort, sorted crustaceans. But whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean risen plain. Yeah, the bottom ones are different. It was the pictorial carving, however, that did most to hold me spellbound. Aegon contains many themes and storytelling methods that Lovecraft developed in his later works, such as telling the story through carvings at the Mountains of Madness and the Nameless City, uh, journals and character notes, the shadow of uh, out of time, the haunt out of dark, islands emerging from the ocean, the call of Cthulhu, or fictional beings and deities based on real events and mythologies. My go in the whispering, or the whisper in darkness. Also, con it's also considered the origin of the uh, popular Cthulhu mythos. Both Lovecraft's other stories also uh, conclude in a manner similar to Dagon, but let's skip the details in order not to spoil the ending. <laughs> Plainly visible across the intervening water, on account of their enormous size, were an array of bas-reliefs whose subjects would have excited the envy of a Dore. I think that these things were supposed to depict men, at least a certain sort of men. Though the creatures were shown disporting like fishes in the waters of some marine grotto, or paying homage at some monolithic shrine which appeared to be under the waves as well. Of their faces and forms I dare not speak in detail, for the mere remembrance makes me grow faint, grotesque beyond the imagination of a Poe or a Bulwer. Pretty damn cool. They were damnably human in general outline, 
despite webbed hands and feet, shockingly wide and flabby lips, glassy, bulging eyes, and other features less pleasant to recall. Curiously enough, they seem to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scenic background. For one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale, represented as but little larger than himself. Cool. Definitely haven't read enough Lovecraft to get all of these. But I'm definitely going to. I definitely feel that. I remarked, as I say, their grotesqueness and strange size. But in a moment decided that they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring tribe. Some tribe whose last descendant had perished eras before the first ancestor of the Piltdown or Neanderthal man was born. Awestruck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist, I stood musing whilst the moon cast queer reflections on the silent channel before me. Then, suddenly, I saw it. Uh, yeah. With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. Like and loathsome, it darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the monolith, about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms, the while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. I think I went mad then. Of my frantic ascent of the slope and cliff, and of my delirious journey back to the stranded boat, I remember little. I believe I sang a great deal and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. Out of the shadows, I was in a San Francisco hospital. Brought thither by the captain of the American ship which had picked up my boat in mid ocean. In my delirium, I had said much, but found that my words had been given scant attention. Of any land upheaval in the Pacific, my rescuers knew nothing. nor did I deem it necessary to insist upon a thing which I knew they could not believe. A journalist. Lovecraft was a prominent figure in the world of amateur journalism. In 1915, he started publishing his own journal called The Conservative, which concluded, uh, included political and social commentary, poetry, short stories, and literary criticism written by him and other authors. Howard was a skilled wordsmith, but he also took criticism to heart, which resulted in his decision to step away from writing poetry and concentrate on weird fiction again. For the first time since his teenage years, well, for the first time since his teenage years, 
Aegon, published in 1919, is one of the short stories written during that period. In this example, uh, excerpt from the conservative, the master of horror fiction explains his attitude towards warfare and the idea of world peace. Why any sane human being can believe in the possibility of a universal peace is more than the conservative conservative can fathom. Should the entire civilized world agree simultaneously to disarm, one or more nations would undoubtedly, undoubtedly retain secret, secret armaments and at the proper time take advantage of their more altruistic and less astute contemporaries in a wild career of conquest against unarmed victims. No country is, or ever can be, above warfare until the basic impulses of human animals shall have miraculously changed. Really cool little insights. Once I sought out a celebrated ethnologist and amused him with peculiar questions regarding the ancient Philistine legend of Dagon, the fish god. Dagon was the main deity in the Philistines worshipped throughout the Middle East as the ancient god of fertility and crops. In Hebrew, the word Dagan uh, was a common noun for grain. Ruler of Akkad, ruler of Akkad, chose him as the patron saint of their war conquest. He also appears as the judged uh, of the dead in, in an Assyrian poem, and <coughs> sorry, and an underworld prison warden uh, warder in one of the Babylonian texts. Is often mistakenly taken for a fish god due to the wrong interpretations of his name. As in Hebrew, the word Dag means fish. In H.P. Lovecraft's work, Dagon is the underwater deity ruling over the Deep Ones, a humanoid race with fish traits that resides in the ocean. He is worshipped by a secret cult called the Esoteric Order of Dagon. Anything else we can look at? But soon perceiving that he was hopelessly conventional, I did not press my inquiries. August Derlicht and the Cthulhu Mythos. August Derlicht was an American writer and uh, anthologist. He also be befriended Lovecraft and published many of, many of his works through his company, Arkham House. Although he greatly contributed to the popularization author's work after his death he is surrounded by numerous controversies. One of the most questionable decisions involved introducing the God of a uh, good versus evil doctrine. Dalek was a devout Catholic uh, to the Cthulhu mythos with which contrasted with Lovecraft's view of the world and his approach to cosmic horror. As a result, the author works were often misunderstood and misinterpreted in today's culture. It is also worth noting that Lovecraft was never really interested in creating a mythology, and the term 
Thulu Mythos was coined by Derelict after the author left the moral pla mortal plane. Okay. Oh, didn't know that. Marketer. Lovecraft's attempt to find a job in 1925 were influenced by advice from by advice he received from friends. Friends. Among others, he started freelancing for a marketing magazine where he would write announcements and commercials. Feel free to judge his copywriting skills for yourself. From an ad for Curtis Woodward. Curtis Woodward embraces both the usual structural units and the cleverest contrivances of built-in or permanent furniture, such as bookcases, dresses, buff, uh, buffets and cupboards. Every model is conceived and created the purest art, uh, ripest scholarship and mellowest craftsmanship which energetic enterprise can command. And made to conform rigidly to the architecture of each particular type of home. The most, uh, the cost, considering the quality, is amazingly low, and trademark on the individual piece prevents any substitution by careless contractors. Hmm. Source: Lovecraft Studies, Volume Seven, Number One. H.P. Lovecraft, S.T. Yoshi. There we go. Scientist. These days the word scientist is a widely accepted term. By the time of Dagon was published, it was subject to a wide debate. After the author used it in a story, critics pointed out that man of science was more appropriate term to employ. He admitted in defense of Dagon, that if Dagon were to be reprinted, he should indeed use the phrase they suggested. Scientist was coined as an analog to artist, to be used when referring to those studying different branches of science. Yet in the 19th and early 20th century, scientist re scientific research in Great Britain and the United States were the opinion that man of science was something the term man of letters was the only proper choice among others uh, among other things it was gender specific indicating that science was the was an endeavor to be pursued only by one sex the term scientist became more acceptable after uh, only after world war ii and man of science started fading into obscurity as an old-fashioned synonym. Pretty damn cool. It is at night, especially when the moon is gibbous and waning, that I see the thing. I tried morphine, but the drug has given only transient surcease and has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave. So now I am to end it all, having written a full account for the information or the contemptuous amusement of my fellow men. Yep, there's the morphine.
Lovecraft hated tobacco, even though he used to smoke when he was 12 in order to look and feel like an adult. Uh, in his correspondence with friends Reinhard Kleiner, he claimed that he quit as soon as he started wearing long pants. He also had a very strong opinion on alcohol, as evidenced by his letter to Celia Brown, dated 13th February 1928. As for the matter of drinking, I have never tasted uh, intoxicating liquor and never intend to. Having a strong aesthetic disgust at anything which blunts or causes the delicate natural equipoise of the evolved human intellect and imagination. Drinking excited my personal repugnance, hence I don't drink. Let the hurt do what they will. I'm rather in favor of prohibition. Prohibition of any one antisocial force as well as any other. But we're down with morphine, apparently. Often, I ask myself if it could not all have been a pure phantasm. A mere freak of fever as I lay sun-stricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man of war. This I ask myself, but ever does there come before me a hideously vivid vision in reply. I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed. Worshipping their ancient stone idols and carving their own detestable likenesses on submarine obelisks of water-soaked granite. I dream of a day when they may rise above the billows to drag down into their reeking talons the remnants of puny, war-exhausted mankind. Of a day when the land shall sink and the dark ocean shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. This is so cool. The end is near. I hear a noise at the door, as of some immense slippery body lumbering against it. Lock the door. Okay. It shall not find me. God, that hand. The window, the window. Love to see, to see this going on for like a lot longer. Okay, but it does have some DLC. Maybe I'll look into that at one point. And uh, well, obviously, I definitely have to go uh, read some more Lovecraft. How the voice uh, you do the same. The wording is, well, it is old writing by now, but from what I've read already, it's like really, really well written. And if you're into horror books, then go for it. Okay, so that was a quick little one this time. So, thank you so much for watching. I hope you appreciate it. Until the next one, take care. Bye.